So let's now discuss how to calculate recombination frequencies and how to predict outcome of genetic crosses with linked genes. So recombination frequency, you use a formula where you, to calculate recombination frequency, use a formula where you divide number of recombinant progeny, recombinant progeny by total number of progeny, total number of progeny, and of course you multiply it by 100%. If you look at this um, example with tomato plants, which we used before, there is a mistake here, um, you can see that it reflects, it uh, outlines a test cross. So let's uh, pretend that you do this crossing. So if you cross uh, normal plants with uh, which is tall, has normal leaves, so it's phenotypically dominant, but you know that it's heterozygous. And you test crosses, of course, test crosses homozygous recessive. So you look at the wood F1 generation of the progeny you obtain, and you see that the most numerous progeny, 55 and 53, are two group of plants which resemble plants, which resemble uh, tester and the tested plants. And you have two recombinant progeny. So immediately, even if you don't know that the uh, genes M and D are linked, it tells you that this is not independent assortment because you did not obtain ratio one to one to one to one. So we know that uh, we know now that these genes are linked. So how to calculate recombination frequency? However, before we go there, uh, basically, since you see recombinant progeny, you know that this is not complete linkage. So there was crossing over. And crossing over, if two genes are linked, you remember, and they are in the same linkage group, the number of recombinant offsprings is less than 50%. And you can clearly see it. These, are, these two are recombinant frequencies. So let's calculate this recombination frequency in this crossing. So if you divide number of recombinant, which is 8 plus 7, which is 15, by total number of progeny, which is 55 plus 53 plus 8 plus 7, which is 123, and you multiply it by 100%, and the result is 12.2%. So the recombination frequencies between gene M and gene D is 12.2%. Now, if you know recombination frequency and you know position of allele of two different genes on the chromosome, you can predict outcome of the crosses with linked gene. Also, if you know recombination frequency, you can position you can outline relative position of two genes on the chromosome. It's not absolute, it's relative position. So genes M and D, recombination frequency is 12.2%, so distance will be 12.2 centimorgan or recombination unit. Centimorgans are arbitrary units which we assign to recombination frequencies and one centimorgan equals one percent of recombination. So as mentioned before, beside knowing recombination recombination frequency, knowing the arrangement of allele on the homologous chromosome is critical in order to determine outcome of genetic crosses with linked genes. So what kind of configuration two genes can have? It is either coupling or cis position or it is repulsion or trans configuration. Let's consider that you have genes A and B and A is dominant over A and B is dominant over B. So we can also say that A and B are wild types and lowercase a and lowercase b are mutant. So if these two genes are in cis position, you will have both wild type or both dominant allele on one homolog and both recessive on second homolog. However, if they are in repulsion or trans configuration, in that case, you will have 
allele, wild type and mutant allele on one chromosome so it would be dominant A and recessive B and also wild type and mutant allele on second one so you will have recessive A and dominant B. So I stress again this is critical knowing configuration of link chains on the homologous chromosome configuration of alleles of link chains is critical to define outcome of genetic crosses and why it is we will discuss in the next slide. So in order to demonstrate importance of the configuration of allele on link, of link chains on the chromosome for defining outcome of genetic crosses, let's follow this example with Australian blowfly. In, in blowfly, we will follow two genes, one which determine color of thorax and one which determines color of puparium. So uh, green thorax is dominant over purple thorax and brown puparium is dominant over black puparium. So now consider that this allele of these two gene are in cis or coupling position which is outlined in A. So if you perform test cross of course tester is always homozygous recessive and your tested individual is blowfly which has green thorax and brown puparium it means it shows wild type phenotype or dominant phenotype and the genes are in this position so this fly will form two kind of gametes non-recombinant and recombinant so the non-recombinant each of them here one non-recombinant would carry both dominant allele and other non-recombinant allele will have both recessive and a recombinant gamete carry combination of these two alleles one dominant and one recessive or one mutant and one one wild type so of course tester only form one kind of gamete so let's look on at the offspring here you see that the non-recombinant progeny which is always uh, the which always has highest number of the offspring highest number of the offspring are non-recombinant 40 of them resemble here 40 of them resemble dominant parent and 40 next most numerous group resemble recessive parent and two groups which are recombinant progeny have a recombination have green thorax and black puparium and purple thorax and brown puparium so recombinant progeny is combination of two parental phenotypes so they do not resemble parents now what if this two allele of these two gene are in trans it's outlined like here you again perform test cross and now the fly blow fly phenotypically is the same as blow fly which had the allele of this two gene in this position because there is com um, complementation so basically this allele this blow fly shows green thorax brown puparium manifest uh, wild type or dominant phenotype however since the alleles of this two gene are in trans there is difference in non-recombinant gametes and recombinant gametes which this individual can form so non-recombinant gamete you see it would be dominant p or wild type p recombinant b and p and wild type B. So non recombinant gametes carry one wild type and one mutated allele of each gene. And you need recombination in order to have gametes which would carry either both wild type or both mutated. Now, if you look into progeny, of course, non recombinant progeny gives you the most individual, most offsprings. And look at this offspring they do not resemble any of the parents it's a recombinant progeny you see 10 and 10 which actually resemble parent this one resemble 
one parent phenotypically dominant or wild type and other resemble tester. So position or arrangement of allele on homologous actually is very important because it define uh, whether non-recombinant or recombinant allele recombinant gametes, sorry, non-recombinant recombinant gametes will be most, will give you uh, individuals after test crossing which would resemble parental generation. And if you have uh, two allele of two gene in cis position, it is non-recombinant progeny with resemble parents, parental phenotypes or carry parental phenotypes. If you have allele of tooling gene in transposition, it's recombinant progeny which resemble or which carry parental phenotype. So keep in mind that offspring of test cross with genes, link genes, this offspring which is the offspring which resemble parents or which carry parental phenotypes are not always non-recombinant. They can be non-recombinant or recombinant depending on how the allele of the stooling genes are arranged on the homologous chromosome. This table just summarizes everything we have discussed up to now and it shows the result of test cross with either independent assortment or linked genes. So if you have independent assortment where two genes, let's say gene A and B, are located on two on different chromosomes and both are heterozygous, test cross yields a result one to one to one to one. So you know immediately if you get this result that basically you have a, your tested individual is heterozygous, double heterozygous, and these two, two genes are sort independently, or I will confuse you a little bit here, or they are on the same chromosome. However, they are so far apart that crossing over takes place in every single meiosis and therefore number of recombinants will be 50% similar as in independent assortment. In such cases two genes are in two different linkage group and basically you cannot really estimate their relative position. However, if we have link genes which are in the same linkage group, you can have two scenarios. Either you have complete linkage which always yield only non-recombinant progeny. You remember complete linkage happens if two genes are too close um, to each other so there is no crossing over and half of the progeny would resemble one parent and half will be, resemble another parent. Now if two genes are in the same linkage group but there is some crossing over taking place you will always have 50% or more than 50% be careful more than 50% non-recombinant and you will have always less than 50% recombinant of springs. So let's now discuss how to predict the outcomes of crosses with linked genes. As you recall, and I repeat again, if you know recombination frequency and if you know position arrangement of alleles of two linked genes on chromosome, you can actually predict outcome of the future crosses. So let's follow this example with a cucumber where warty fruits are dominant over smooth and dull. This is the second gene D genes where dull is dominant over glossy. Let's consider you are a scientist who performs these crosses and you already know based on the previous crosses that the recombination frequency is 16%. So you know that recombination frequency is 16%. And you know based on the previous crosses that you have plant which is phenotypically dominant and which has the um, allele of genes T and G 
gene D in cis position. So the configuration of this individual which you will test cross is T and D like this. So if you test cross this plant right here and you want to predict outcome of, gen of the future crosses. So what do you have to do first? First you know the distance between these two gene genes T and D is 16 centimorgan, yes, because it is 16% of recombination. So when you want to predict outcome, what you have to define first is what kind of gamete this person would for this individual, sorry, cucumber is not person, sorry for my mistake, how many, what kind of uh, offspring or gametes this individual plant will form. So you define or estimate number of non-recombinant gamete and number of recombinant gametes. So what would be no, what, what which gametes will be non-recombinant gametes carrying both dominant alleles and gamete carrying both recessive alleles. So those would be non-recombinant. So what would be recombinations? What kind of gamete will be formed after crossing over? So we will have one will have dominant T and a recessive D and second one will have recessive T and dominant D. So whenever you want to predict outcome of genetic crosses and you know recombination frequency and position of alleles of two genes on the chromosome, first step you have to do is to define which gametes are non-recombinant and which gametes are recombinant. Now, you know that distance between this two gene is 16 centimorgan and recombination frequency is 16%. So you will have 16% recombinant gametes, meaning when you do test cross, 16% of progeny will be recombinant. And you have non-recombinant is of course 100% minus 16, which will give you 84%. 84% will be of gametes will be non-recombinant. Now, 84% will be non-recombinant. However, you have two kind of gamete. So both together form 84%. So each one's the probability that this individual plant will form gamete with both dominant uh, allele will be half of non-recombinant frequency. So it would be 42 percent. The same for second one. Okay. Uh, identically, when you look for recombinant gametes, both recombinant gam both kind of recombinant gametes will, will comprise of 16 percent of progeny. So, 8 percent will be, will have dominant T recessive D and 8 percent will have recessive T and dominant D. So if you convert this into the frequency uh, calculation, so you will have 0.42, here is 0.42, and this one is 0 0.08, and this one is 0 0.08. Once you know frequency by which each kind of gametes is formed, you can actually uh, predict outcome using um, prediction multiplication rules because you know you will have since you have you perform test cross so you know the test reform only one kind of commit and frequency here is 100 percent equaling one so in that case you know you have four different kind of commits in your tested individual, so we will have four different categories of offsprings. You just use multiplication rule. If you want to define what would be um, what would be prediction of obtaining Wartidal fruit, so basically you have this individual from tester gets home gamete with both recessive alleles. So what is the frequency of gamete having both dominant alleles in the tested individual? It's right here. It's 0.42. So 0.42 multiplying by 1, you have predicted frequency 0.42 or it will be 42 
percent of offspring will have watered out fruit and you do this calculation for each single group of the offspring which you know from gametes what kind of offspring which phenotypes they will have when you test grow them so you can calculate and predict um predict the um, offsprings phenotypes so when you predict outcome of genetic crosses with linked genes, in most cases, the outcome will be clear because you will have much more non-recombinant progenies and recombinant. However, sometimes the difference between, in, between offsprings, recombinant, non-recombinant, will not be so great and it would be difficult to de define or estimate immediately whether you are dealing with independent assortment or linked genes. So how do you proceed? In that case, you have to um, test whether you are looking at independent assortment by using chi-square tests. And basically, the question you ask here is different uh, than the question you ask when you are sure that you have independent assortment. So the question you ask here is, is the inheritance of allele at one locus independent of the inheritance of allele at the second locus? So you ask whether the inheritance you are following, whether it is independent assortment, inheritance which follows independent assortment. So your no hypothesis will be the inheritance of allele at one locus is independent of the inheritance of allele or at a second locus. So how do you proceed? You will use the test for independence in genotype with a chi-square test of independence. So this chi-square test of independence is slightly different. And you will see in this example outline here why it is different. So let's follow this example, this crosses. We will follow cockroaches. Brrr. Well, I don't like cockroaches, but this is an example from the book, so let's call, follow the cockroaches. So you perform a test cross of the individual cockroaches where you follow body color where brown is dominant over yellow and shape of wings when straight wings are dominant over curved wings. So you test cross the individual, which is heterozygous, and basically you don't know whether it is independent assortment or whether it is linked genes because the difference between recombinant and non-recombinant is not completely one to one to one to one, but it's not completely clear that you have much more non-recombinant. So you cross, you test cross this cockroach, and you get. These are the offsprings you get, 63, 28, 33, and 77. So now, in order to, you remember, to perform uh, chi-square, chi-square is a sum of observed squares, sum of squares observed minus expected divided by expected. Now we run in one problem here and you know if you have independent assortment following Mendelian inheritance you know what is expected according to the expected ratios. However in under this condition, when you test chi square, when you use chi square test of independence, you don't know what the expected might be. So you have to calculate it. And this is a table you use in order to calculate expected outcome. So in this cross, would you in this table, this table resembles Punnett square, but it's not completely the same. Pay attention. On one on the on the in top of the table, you put just possible combination of allele of one genotype. This one, this time, will be uh, body color. So we see one parent is heterozygous and another tester is homozygous recessive. On the other side, you put uh, another gene genotype and you will see for the wings, one parent here is heterozygous, you put it here, and another is homozygous recessive, you put it here. And now you put in 
number of offspring you observed here number of observed you counted and observed so those which will have browned body and straight wings is 63 those which have brown body and curved wing is 633 and so on so you put corresponding number of the offspring in this table and you calculate row totals and column totals and of course total number of individual so now how do you calculate expected numbers so you construct another second table right here where you put number of observed which we you know you put all genotypes you observed phenotypes with corresponding genotypes and you put number of observed and what is the number of expected so in this first row you have uh, cockroach with cockroaches with brown body and straight wings so in order to calculate expecting number you actually take you multiply number of all individual which had yellow sorry brown body which is 91 right here and you multiply it by both all individual which had straight wing right here so all straight wing are 96 so it is 91 by 96 91 by 96 and you divide it by all individuals and this give you expected number for this category and you do this calculation for every single genotype Phenotype, phenotypic group of the individual and you get expected once you have expected number you just perform classical chi-square calculation as a sum of square of observed minus expected divided by expected so if you put all the number together you will get your chi-square number which you have to uh, look for the probability in the table you remember the table we use it's the same ta table however how do we calculate degree of freedom here so degree of freedom it's right here it's number of rows minus one multiplied by number of column minus one you see you have two rows and you have two columns so it would be degree of freedom will be one so you go you open your book you look in the table and you see that probability corresponding to chi-square number 30.75 is the probability is lower than 0 0.005 so what does it tell you this result tells you that the probability indicates that the difference between number of observed and expected progeny is probably not due to chance you remember what was our question our null hypothesis our null hypothesis was that the inheritance of, of uh, um, body color and wing shape is following independent assortment so basically the probability is too high probability is too low that this is uh, what is happening you have to reject your null hypothesis and basically your uh, conclusion is that the genes for body color and type of wings are not assorting independently so in that therefore they must be linked